So today, let's discuss plastics, or I guess more specifically, plastic pollution and potential resolutions of this somewhat unnerving phenomenon. Unnerving because, in the last years, there's basically been nothing but bad news when it comes to plastic pollution. Mostly because recycling microplastics, as you probably know, is not particularly efficient and in the past decade has faced a lot of different challenges. Not only is it very labor-intensive, it's also very uneconomical and results in very poor yield when it comes to recovery. And so, as a result, plastic pollution has now become probably one of the biggest challenges facing our planet, on par with a lot of other issues and possibly even bigger than most of us can imagine. And in one of the recent videos on a very cool visualization known as Biocubes, the video that you can find in the description, we've actually discussed how plastics now basically outweigh all humans by almost 100 times. With all of this accumulating in the biosphere and already causing quite a lot of issues to quite a lot of species. Now, the actual damage is still uncertain, but we know that as of 2024, we already have the first designated disease that seems to be caused by plastics. It's currently known as plasticosis. And though the actual impact is still not clear, it seems to cause physical damage caused by ingesting plastic and so far has mostly been discovered in various birds. With this particular bird, essentially serving as a kind of a first example. And so here it seems to cause a major tissue damage, with a lot of this damage potentially irreversible, mostly caused by tiny pieces of plastic digging into the internal lining of the stomach and causing the birds to eventually die. And apparently 90% of all birds from one particular study in a description were discovered to have signs of this already. And so here they decided to name this plasticosis. Mostly because, just like other fibrotic diseases, like silicosis and asbestosis, they seem to create a very similar type of tissue damage, except that in this case, unlike asbestosis, it's not in the lungs, this one is in the stomach. And though obviously the first conclusion from this is that don't eat plastics, it's really not that easy. As we'll discuss in one of the future videos I'm working on right now, microplastics have now been found in pretty much most organs in humans. It's in our blood, it's in deepest parts of our lungs, it has even been discovered in our sperm and in testes, and more recently, it was found to be in placenta and by extension in newly born babies. So basically microplastics that we both breathe in and swallow potentially could cause a lot of diseases in humans as well. Nothing concrete has been discovered yet, but a lot of this research is just from the last four to five years. So yeah, just wait, I guess. And according to some of the recent calculations, just in terms of breathing alone, we seem to inhale a single credit card worth of microplastics every single week. That's like 52 credit cards per year. That's more credit than anyone ever needs. Uh, okay, on a more serious note, it is very concerning. Once again, because there's just so much plastic everywhere. And a lot of that stuff that we're breathing in is actually coming from the rain, because plastic, or microplastics, is now also in the rain clouds. So technically we're turning Earth into, yeah, I guess, a plastic planet. But we're actually going to explore all of this in a video that's coming out sometimes in the next few weeks, so do subscribe if you would like to learn more. And that's mostly because in this video I wanted to focus on something different. Although there's actually one thing I wanted to mention. Okay, so who's causing all of this and who's responsible? Well, obviously to some extent us for buying all of the plastic products, but there are certain companies, and specifically five main companies, responsible for the majority of plastic pollution, and you can probably guess what they are. Most of them are companies manufacturing soft drinks, so here we're talking about Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, Nestle, and Danone, but also at least one company manufacturing cigarettes. In this case, it's Altria. But if we ignore individual companies, when it comes to basically the main production of plastics, it all seems to come from the fashion industry. There's no one specific company, but altogether, fashion seems to add the most. And mostly because synthetic clothing has really become super cheap, with many fashion industries switching to this over previously used things like, for example, cotton. As a matter of fact, recently, I'm also kind of to blame. I went on one of those super cheap Chinese shops and bought a t-shirt for like 6 bucks that honestly feels absolutely great, but it's made out of 100% synthetic material, essentially different types of plastics. And so obviously, to resolve all of this and to potentially find solutions, in the last few years there's been a lot of potential propositions on how we can maybe get rid of this plastic pollution. And that's going to be actually the focus of that next video. But just to give you a bit of a preview, researchers have already discovered or manufactured 
Anything from bacteria to plastic eating worms, mushrooms, bugs, and even synthetic egg whites that in theory can break plastic apart or use it for something else. But naturally all of these solutions are still basically just being tested and nothing concrete exists yet. There is, however, a really intriguing solution that's been proposed, I guess like a decade ago, that basically instead of recycling, focuses on upcycling. And that's the concept I wanted to discuss today because of this new study. And here, unlike recycling, upcycling essentially transforms plastic into something possibly more valuable and something that has a lot of demand. So basically here, we're turning trash into gold. But what is that something and how do we achieve it? Well, in the last five years, several studies proposed turning plastics into maybe fuel or even turning them into capacitors, with one study even creating quantum dots that can then be used in electronics. But there's actually one thing that's been really difficult to make and very expensive to make that apparently plastics and specifically microplastics are perfect for. And that something is graphene. The carbon-based material that's actually relatively difficult to make in large quantities and by itself because of this is really expensive. And even though there are quite a lot of techniques to create small amounts, most of them have quite a few shortcomings and don't actually create a lot of graphene or require a lot of specific inputs. But in the last four or so years, there's actually been quite a few papers, including this recent one that you can find in the description, that essentially propose using microplastics as a way to effectively and relatively cheaply produce graphene in relatively large quantities in some sense, solving two problems at once, getting rid of microplastics and getting more graphene on the cheap. Fun fact, I actually discovered this paper completely by accident while working on a script for why space elevator technology does not exist yet. And while well, one of the reasons is that we actually don't have enough graphene and cannot make enough to create a powerful enough cable for a space elevator to function. But because of studies like this, there might be actually a chance now. And so let's talk about what the scientists did and how they did this. Now this is obviously not the first such proposition. Researchers have actually proposed using plastic waste to create graphene in other studies as well. But in most of these previous studies, they essentially used a relatively complex heating technique in order to melt microplastics and in order to then start forming graphene. And even in these earlier techniques, despite the fact that plastic had to be heated up with all this requiring energy, the overall production was already pretty effective. Here the initial calculations suggested that by using approximately 1 tons of microplastics, the overall cost of electricity would only be about $120. But in this new study they potentially found an even better technique that seems to be more effective and much much faster. Once again using microplastics, 1 to 3 millimeters in size, but this time, I guess for the lack of better words, microwaved inside a tube filled with argon. Here they used argon instead of any other gas because it doesn't actually react with anything. And so here by using a 2.45 GHz microwave power supply with the power levels of about 400 to 600 watts, they microwaved this microplastic, which over time started to deposit graphene inside the tube. And interestingly enough, after just one minute, they were able to turn 30 mg of microplastics into 5 mg of graphene without really doing anything else. Here the graphene was formed autonomously as long as the other gases were also removed. And because of this relatively high production rate and this somewhat unusual and somewhat novel technique, literally just using a kind of a modified microwave oven, the researchers were able to generate plasma that turns all microplastics into graphene, hydrogen and CO2 with this new technique now known as atmospheric pressure microwave plasma synthesis. Cool name for basically a plastic microwave oven. Okay, I'm obviously oversimplifying things, but in essence that's really what it is. It produces plasma inside and that plasma then first changes the plastics into various molecules including methane and then those methane molecules start to form graphene inside the tube. But obviously this is just the first such attempt and the first such experiment. Assuming that this actually works and assuming that it's recreated and potentially somehow upscaled, we might actually reach the point where upcycling, or I guess turning plastics into something more expensive and more needed, might become a reality after all. But at least for now, it's just one such paper, and until it's replicated, and until we actually see how this could be done in industrial capacity, unfortunately microplastics are still going to remain a bit of a problem, or possibly a much bigger problem than we ever realized. And how big of a problem, you may ask? Well, all of this is going to be in the next part, coming out in the next few weeks. 
And so until then, check out some of the previous videos on similar topics in the description below. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.